pray. Right? Yes, we pray on Sundays together as a community, and the way we do that is very important, but people were wanting tools to pray what are the days to Monday through Saturday as well. Um, and so we wanted to structure three forums this summer before we're kind of back to school in the fall. Uh, so this uh, the today kicks off what are intended to be three. Uh, on, and we wanted to give people tools to pray, but before we did that, we wanted to start with the context of St. Margaret's and why inclusive language matters to us. So before we turn to the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, which we'll do in July, having had our perspective today first, we'll look to understand our prayer book on July 18th. And on August 22nd, we're having a special guest from um, the St. Helena community, which is a Benedictine order of Episcopal nuns. And they have been champions of inclusive language in the Episcopal Church, and they have published their own breviary, which is, you know, a monastic talk for a prayer book, the prayers that they use uh, on a daily basis. And it essentially is what I think of as the Book of Common Prayer turned into an inclusive language um, book. And so we'll have one of the co-creators of that book uh, speak with us in August. So here we are today, a kind of introduction to prayer and to the language we use. July, a look at the Book of Common Prayer, and in August, a look at the St. Helena tradition. Final word of thanks uh, to my friend and colleague, Diana Gustafson, who has done all of the lion's share of preparation and making today possible. Thank you, Diana. Uh, and just to know, she'll introduce the speakers each of our guests will speak for 10 to 15 minutes by themselves, and then we'll transition to a conversation and, and open up for questions. That's the plan. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience as we're a little starting late. Thank you, Richard. Can you hear me? No. Yes? Okay. Um, as uh, Richard said, uh, thank you. Um, well, let me just say that when I came here in February, one of the first things I heard loudly and clearly was that uh, my use of the word he for God was no longer acceptable. <laughs> um, I, I got kind of kicked in the butt uh, quite a few times for uh, my misstep. Um, so I, I, took, I took those directions very seriously, uh, so seriously that I began to do a lot of reading and a lot of calling and talking to people, uh, which led to conversations with our three speakers today, and which opened up my mind and my uh, heart, really, to what is possible when we talk about what we mean about who God is, and not only about who God is, but about who we are when we pray. And how do we understand who we are, who the other people are, and who everyone else is around us as children of God, what, what that identity is. One of the people whom I spoke to uh, quite a few times was, of course, uh, Vienna, the Reverend Vienna Cobb Anderson, who was the rector here at St. Margaret's from 1987 to 1995. And as she will tell you herself, but I will toot the horn uh, first, was instrumental in the history of inclusivity at St. Margaret's, both in terms of welcoming people into the church, but also in terms of changing the language, of uh, opening up the language at St. Margaret's. Uh, so she'll give us some insight into the introduction and history of inclusive language at St. Margaret's uh, and her experience as the first female rector here and I believe in the Episcopal Church in Washington and how that really changes how or changed how the people of St. Margaret's uh, came to understand who they were as children of God. So, Vienna. <laughs> I'm 
Don't you try to be high tech? Uh, can you hear me first of all? No. No, you cannot. Is that better? All right. If I, if at any moment my voice fails, wave your hand and I'll know that you're not asking a question. You just can't, can't hear me. I'm going to give you a back story. Uh, not when I came, but before I came, because the story of uh, inclusive language of St. Margaret's has a very long history. When I was three years old, that would be in 1938, my grandmother would take me to church with her. And every Sunday we'd go into the sacristy where she would take the pattern filled with bread, wafers, and she'd take them off. And to take slices of bread and cut them up into little cubes and put those on the pattern. <laughs> Being three years old, this was my eye view. I could just see what was on the table. She never said a word to me about what she did or why she did it. But I got the lesson that my grandmother cut up enough bread for the entire congregation. Vienna. Yes. I think you just need to do that little switchy lever thing. Oh, I on do the that. No, can you hear me still? Okay, good. Do I need to start over? Did you get what I said before? Okay. So when we would go up to the altar rail, of course, as a child, we were not fed. I would watch the priest come by, and there was the pattern filled with wafers and two cubes of bread. What happened to all those others, I called. He had wiped them out, put back the, the little wafers, and left one cube for my grandfather, who was the senior warden for 25 <laughs> years, and one for his wife, who was his ancillary, and of course she deserved it if he got it. And that was it. And every Sunday we'd go back and she'd do the same routine. She never said one word of what she was doing or why she was doing it, she just did it. And I, as a three-year-old, learned that going to church was about thinking about everyone, not just what you needed, what you wanted to get from God, but it was about caring about everyone who came, that they too could have what she considered the full body of Christ, not fish food. And she would keep on her mission to make certain that this message of love and inclusivity got through to that priest. I hate to say she failed with him. She succeeded with me. <laughs> that was the beginning of the journey for inclusion. Whoops, come on, come back here. Now, when I am 10 years old, I, by this time, have become rather obstreperous and outspoken. I'm in a junior choir at a different church. We're standing in a building about as long as this, not as wide, and I happen to be standing next to the rector. I was yay high, he was about yay high, no, maybe this high. And I looked at him and I said, Dr. Hark, you taught me that to love God was to love God was to, to worship God was to love God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. And he pats me on the head like a good little girl. And he says, that's right. And I looked at him straight in the eye and said, Dr. Hart, by your own definition, worship at St. Stephen's is a lie. Because all you let us do is sing hymns and mumble on them. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a world where only men were at the table. I never saw a woman read a lesson, say a prayer. As a matter of fact, the priest did everything, absolutely everything. And all we did was sing hymns and love along that. So I decided it was time for me to follow my calling in the 1960s, and I sought to be ordained. And I went to the priest to talk to him about the process. And he said, well, you can't be. I said, why not? He said, because in the canons it says in the back of the prayer book, when a man goes for ordination, I said, so? He said, that means men only. I said, wait a minute, in the front of the prayer book, we pray for all sorts and conditions of men. You tell me that's inclusive. Yes, it is, he said. I said, no, it isn't. You can't have it both ways. It can't be exclusive here and inclusive there. There's no parenthesis behind.
find it saying, this is for men and women, this time man means man only. He looked at me like I was crazy. Then I went to seminary to read, uh, to study, and I wound up in a class, I had to drop out because I got ill, wound up in a class of 20 men and me. And I said, question after question after question, don't run for vote me, I'll just go through when you get out and do what you want to do. And what happens to my soul, I said. They looked at me like I was crazy. So they kept on this vein, and I finally said, stop talking down to me. Oh, we don't talk down to you. I said, yes, you do. No, we don't. But you must remember me under this difference between priests and other Christians. I said, that's just what I'm talking about. What's this difference? And they sat silent. Finally, the one priest in the room said, I can celebrate the Eucharist and you can't. And I snapped back, and you can't celebrate without me. Well, it is to say the whole conference broke up. I did not go to seminary, I ended up reading for moments. As finally, Diamond said, I was ordained, and I was the first woman to be called to be a rector in Washington, D.C. I was at that ordination of the first woman in seven in Philadelphia, too. It was a great day. Um, when I came here, none of the male clergy in the area would talk to me. There was a group of clergy rectors, I don't know, of 20, I believe, I was excluded. I was not allowed to join. It's only for certain ones, as they said. I invited the three nearest parishes, the four nearest parishes, all Saints, all Saints, up the street, all Saints, all Souls, St. All Souls, all Thomas's and St. John's and St. Margaret's to come together after I've been here for six months. Well, they came, and I said, look, all of us are going through our endowments like crazy. Shouldn't we be working together on projects? Oh, no, you do what you want to do. Come do what we want to do. And thank you for lunch. Goodbye. I never heard from you again. Well, that didn't sit well with a redhead, let me tell you. When you have a red hair, you have a temper. <laughs> you have a passion for life, is the way I'd want to say it. So that did not sit well. I came here having served at St. Albans Parish in Washington. Uh, having started out in St. Stephen in Carnation as a layperson, went to St. Albans for seminary, hired by them, and then when I was called to a parish in Massachusetts, after I negotiated the contract, went up and said what day my arrival would be, the day my first preaching, the day of my institution. I left on Sunday, they called me on Monday and said, it's no go, the head of the search committee will have to call you, and the phone went dead. And they decided they did not want a woman. They wanted the name of the second runner up who was a man. They wanted him for their rector, not a woman. Well, I'd already resigned from my position at St. Albans, so I had no job. So I went to the bishop and said, I'd like to belong with the community, people who are going out of the church and those who are looking for a way back in. I don't want a congregation that is happy as they are. I want people who are unsettled. And so we formed Cannabis, and we called it the Community of Hagar. Now you heard in the sermon this morning that Moses said to God, who shall I say sends me? Hagar didn't say that. Hagar is the only person in scripture who names God. She says, I will call you the God who sees. Well, that empowered me to think, women, come on, we're gonna do some naming. So the community of Hagar began by experimenting everything. I said to them, my role is up for grabs. Oh, you can't do that. You can't give your power away. Watch me, he said. So everything was up for grabs. Who would celebrate? Why? Who would preach? Who would teach? Who would lead worship? And we developed a way of gathering the community together that I brought with me here. So if anybody in the congregation wants to Blame anyone for an inclusive language at St. Margaret's. Don't let them cuss these two people out. Blame comes to me because I insisted. I came here and I was interviewed all day long. It wasn't a short interview. And at the end, I hadn't asked any questions. They said, do you have any questions? I said, I have one. Do you have the courage to call? I don't expect an answer now, but think about it. So if they did call me, and when I arrived, the sign outside said, it's a girl, and it's a pink <laughs> 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 
thanks to Barbara Rollinson, I believe, who arranged that. Uh, and I have never forgotten that welcome. So the bishop gave us permission to be inclusive. I wrote him and talked to him, and he gave us a letter in writing saying, you may experiment with the liturgy. You may use an inclusive language lectionary. St. Stephen of the Incarnation had one, and so we took that, borrowed it, and used it. Um, the next thing we, oh God, I couldn't see you. Oh, we had six retarded men in our congregation. They eventually grew to 12. Johnny sat in the front row, which was right up here those days. And came to the peace, Johnny would jump up and go, the peace of the Lord! And that's how we shared the peace here. Uh, these men taught us to be receiving and receptive of everyone. They were a great gift to this parish. They would, they would take part in the liturgy. They would come forward and want to be blessed uh, by the bishop when we had confirmation. They would be part. They want to be installed with the vestry. We came to love them and know them by name, and they were, they were special to us. One day, Johnny was standing out on the front steps that snowed badly, and a parishioner from St. Patrick's couldn't get to her church. So they walked down here, and she was greeted by Johnny, and she said to me later, you know, when he greeted me, I knew there was a place for me here, too. That's what Johnny and his friends all said to us. There is a place for everyone in this congregation. Now, shortly after I came, the, the Pope declared that uh, Roman Catholic Church would no longer receive anyone from dignity, nor could dignity worship in any Catholic institution. So dignity called me up, having done some work for them before they said, could we come and worship at St. Barbara's? And we welcomed them with open arms. Dignity came and worshiped every Sunday, and they're still here every Sunday. And they became an important part of our congregation because many of the men would come to me and say, you know, we like having our own community, but we want to be part of the larger church. We don't want to be excluded. We want to be part of the whole. And they began to become members of both Dignity and St. Margaret's. Many served on our best group. Uh, many came and became a part of our, part of our Sunday school. They became an integrated part of this community's life. That brings up another subject that was very early in my ministry here, and that is the issue of AIDS. It hit us like a ton of bricks. We had awful lot of men here who had AIDS and who died of AIDS. Barbara and I were speaking earlier of Michael Pleasance, who was a well beloved member of this parish, who was the first person to die of AIDS. Steve Lombesis came to me and said, I'm taking medicine for the first time. May I take it with my communion wafer? And I gave him his communion wafer bread with his pill in his hand, and that's how he took his first medicine. It also led us to start a group of people who were living with AIDS or those who had lost someone who had died of AIDS. This community wrapped around the people who were dying. I would watch 20, 30, 40 people sitting in a hospital hallway all night waiting while their friend died. And they were members of the community, gay or straight. Uh, it was an important part of our learning about what it is to be inclusive. Because language is not just about verbal words. It's about how you live. And as Diana said earlier, it shapes who we are, which is a prayer. It shapes who we are, and who we are shapes our prayer. And this is very an important part of St. Margaret's history of inclusive language is it didn't stop with just words. One of the first things I did when I came here also was to have lay leadership along with the clergy for the liturgy. I never opened a service. The lay persons opened the service. They did everything up to peace. The only thing that a clergy person would do is read the gospel or give out a solution. Every rest of the service was done by one of the lay members, and they rotated, taking turns to it. And the prayers of the people have always been said by the lay here. Another conclusion that came out of our language and concern was the concern for children. I had a requirement of my seminarians that they had to make a, an animal for our Christmas pageant, so we developed the children's zoo in the corner over here. 
first a donkey, then a camel, literally a high, and then a sheep. And that was the children's corner. They would go over there. Well, Barbara's first granddaughter, Laura, was two years old. I remember her standing there patting the sheep one day. She said to me, I'd like to be a crucifer. A mm -hmm. cross? There's no way. So I thought, why not? I went and bought a little cross this big, got it down on this log, nailed it together. She came down the aisle on Easter with a cross at an angle like this, and the congregation just beamed. We had children crucifers from then on. Children became an important part. Sometimes we put my childhood table up here on the platform, and the children would sit around it and make Eucharist. And every child knew the words to say. If I invited an adult to come up and be a child spare at the last minute, what am I supposed to say? Would always be the question. Not a child. I watch the children tell each other. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. They fed one another at the table while I was feeding everybody else about these ratings. This all out here became a part of what changed because of light mission. We not only wanted to speak inclusively, we wanted to be closer to one another. We had to go up to the altar rail. People handicapped couldn't get up there. We built this platform so you could see. I think we should have built it wider and further out now, telling Richard to get rid of it. <laughs> um, but we took the altar rail and made portable altar rails down here that we could move in and out. So that people could come up at 11 o'clock in New York, 9 o'clock, and stand. Around the table. It was in order to make us feel that we were all a part of this as one whole, not fractions. There was a woman here who used to help us bake our bread. She worked for a pastoral family that I've known since the 60s, came to St. Margaret's when I came here. I looked at Sakina one day and I said, Sakina, you help us bake the bread, but wouldn't you like to take communion? I said, oh, yes, I would. I said, then come. She was Muslim. I didn't tell anyone. See, there's a rubric in the prayer book that says, if you are baptized Christian or desirous of a relationship with God, you may receive communion. I've never known a woman more desirous of a relationship with God. If anybody deserved to eat the bread, she could bake it, took it out of the pan, from bare hands out of the oven deserve to eat that bread. Um, about that. That ah, another thing that liturgy changed us. As we became more aware of getting to know each other, really know one another's feelings and what was happening in people's lives, uh, and this happened in many ways, Church, you could stand up on the steps and greet people coming up and down before church and say, Good morning, how are you? A bit of a surprise to someone that's spoken to me. Uh, we'd invite them to come in, and sometimes they would, and many times they wouldn't. But we became aware that many people would say, It's hard to come back to church after my spouse died because it reminds me of the funeral. So we put Kleenex in every pew because we wanted people to know. This was a place you could cry. This was the place you had to have it all together and be nice. One lady called me up one day and she said, um, I've never been to your church. Uh, do you wear hats to church? <laughs> and I froze for a moment on the telephone and I thought, yes, this woman who does. I said, yes, Mrs. Green always wears the most beautiful hats to church. Some people do, but many don't. I said, you'll find people in it in shorts. Oh, lovely, she said, goodbye. So, so I came to church on Sunday morning and the lay reader came rushing up to me and said, I owe you an apology. I said, for what? He said, I biked to church today in my shorts and I forgot to bring a change of clothing. I said, you saved me. Because I told the lady somebody would be here in shorts. And here you are, right that front. That's the way St. Margaret's was. Come as you are, come with your feelings and don't hide them. Don't pretend to be something that you are not. Uh, the name tags outside became part of that extending, getting to know each other. And then 
Another community that came and joined us was the Hispanic community, and that's why there's an altar back there, because it was a tiny little church. They had maybe six or eight people, then 10, and maybe 20, and they felt comfortable being all enclosed together. And they worshipped this for quite a while until the St. John's call the Hispanic community to come and be a part of their, their church, and so they left. But the protesters came through marching in 30 years ago, I guess it is this year, uh, to the uh, Tiananmen Square. The Chinese embassy is just two blocks up. They passed by here, and so we decided to have water refreshments. We opened our doors and invited them to come in. And they came in and they filled the parish hall back there and showed a picture to us that likes it, which we've never seen in the newspapers. And then he came in here for a silent time, and one man picked up the Bible that was at the end of the pew and said, may I have this? And I said, yes, take it. So often what we did, we never knew the end result. That wasn't important. It was that we stepped forward and did something, acted, and said, yes, take the Bible. Where the Bible ended up, I'll never know. That's all right. It has its own journey to make. That's the kind of community St. Margaret's is building, becoming a, a way of letting language not only come out of our lips, but seep out of our hearts, change our hearts, open our arms wider, so that everyone could feel that they had a place here. Uh, I've talked about the AIDS ministry. Charlie's place began with simple bag lunches, because people used to ring the doorbell all the time, wanting money for food. And you never knew it was money for drugs or money for food. And so we ended up packing up bag lunches and people would come here during the weekday, pack up the lunches and we'd have the shelf, long, long shelf like food sitting ready to get up. One day I passed a man on the street who was begging a tourist for money. And I said, don't give him any money, he can go to St. Margaret to get what he needs. And the man started cussing me out. I said, you know you can go to St. Margaret's, I've seen you there. You can get a bag lunch if you're that hungry. I wouldn't eat that expletive. Well, I lost my red head jump. <laughs> Don't you ever speak so disparagingly about the kindness of another human being. Somebody gives their time and love to create that food for you. You don't want to say no thank you, but don't you ever press them out me. He's left. I never saw him back here again, I know. Um, our logo which I was delighted to see on the bulletin this morning, is also a part of reflecting how St. Margaret is changing as we change our use of language. I forget what our logo was before I came. I don't even remember what it was like. Uh, but I think it just said St. Margaret's Church, maybe just because. But one of the Christians and I got together and we designed a circle, meaning everyone is included. And a broken cross to stand for both the brokenness of our life and the healing that the cross brings to us. And uh, that was another part of how we try to express not only the thought and deed, but visually what this parish means to us. I guess I was here three or four years, and I became very aware that there were no prayers in our prayer book for many of the issues people were presenting. One of the first was a young woman. She and her husband came and said, we have found out we have to have an abortion. A child has a tumor on its neck in the womb, and it's going to kill the child. And we don't believe in abortion. What do we do? So I wrote a liturgy for abortion. That is, in this book, which was written, out of the issues and needs of St. Martin's. I wrote the liturgy so the lay person could do it because I knew many clergy who didn't believe in abortion wouldn't do a, a prayer or a ritual for abortion where you anointed the hands, the head, and the heart. Uh, so if a lay person or a priest could do it. Another good friend came to me and said, We're getting a divorce and it's awful. We got married in church. We have to go to the law court to get divorced. I said, Come to St. Margaret's, we'll do a ritual for divorce. So we wrote the ritual for divorce. We had gay men come and say we want to get married, and the bishop said, No, you can't. And 
And I said to the bishop, you will admit this congregation in class. Well, we don't want the publicity. I said, neither do they. And we've had many gay marriages here, starting back in the 80s. And a ritual is in this book. Another couple came and said, our house broke down. There's no ritual for fire. And my former parish person said, my husband has been kidnapped by the terrorists in uh, Beirut. He was the first journalist ever to be kidnapped. And there was no, no prayer for terrorism or kidnapping. Here, I met with many people who were drug addicted, alcohol addicted. And there is no prayer in a book of common prayer at that time except for those who were alcohol addicted. So we wrote prayers for all kinds of addiction. And not to mention there are all kinds of other prayers. Every one of these prayers in here came out of this community. The needs of this community to be whole and to be able to worship openly together in a way that they felt included and not excluded. And we exclude not only by the language we use, but by the way we treat one another. And that is an initiative that as Dinah said this morning. You know, I grew up in a world where the boys mattered, the girls didn't. I mean, my brother got an unlimited bank account at age 11. I was getting 25 cent allowance, and we were only one year apart. I was thinking, everybody expected him to take over the family business. No one had expectations of me except that I'd get married. <coughs> that was it. Uh, no wonder I struggled to get three doctorates. <laughs> <laughs> Try to prove yourself kind of thing going on. But that was the life that we did grow up in, and that's the life that many today, not because of necessarily sexual discrimination, but all kinds of discrimination, are having to still face. We still live in a very restricted world that does not welcome you in whoever you are. This is the only place I know that does. I, I, I've been so grateful to St. Margaret's. Not only for receiving me, because I was, let me tell you, on the far fringes, I didn't think anybody would ever call me to be their rector, and you had the courage to do it. And you made this rector feel at home, but you have made countless people feel, I have a home here, I belong here, I am loved here, I am needed here, I am wanted here, I have a ministry here, I have things that I can give and share and create and help this place to grow. It's all because of the way that you grabbed hold of change. You didn't turn your back on it, you opened your arms to it. You opened your arms to try new things. And I think we stand today at a time where we have been changed by COVID and we're never going to be the same again. And you stand on the premise of doing a new thing. I bless you for doing that and taking that risk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Diana. Our next our next speaker is Dr. Diane Liu, who is the co-founder and co-director of Water, the Women's Alliance of for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual. She's also the author of a new book, Stirring the Waters, which I thought I had up with me up here, but I don't. But she also has on, oh, what she has right here, Stirring the Waters, she's displaying it. She also, there are also some out in the parish hall. Um, as well as many other publications. Diane is well versed in the theology of inclusion. She talked to me a great deal about uh, how we can consider a God who is entirely expansive in self-identity in contrast to the patriarchal figure that many of us grew up with and that is still represented to us in scripture and in the standard prayers and teachings of the Book of Common Prayer. So welcome, Diane, and I look forward, we all look forward to what you can tell us and the ways in which you will enlighten us.
think I'm on. Can you hear me okay? No, we can't. No, a little louder? Yeah. Better? I'll pretend like I have my grade school teacher voice on. Great. So let me just say, first of all, Vienna, thank you. Richard and Diana, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this forum. What a pleasure. You know, Vienna, when you were telling your story, I was in seminary, the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, in 1977. When the Episcopal women were ordained in 74, we thought the wave was with us. I really grew up thinking I'd be the first Catholic woman ordained in this country, if not the world. And here we are doing the pioneering work outside of the churches, alongside of the churches that you, Vienna, and your cohorts were able to do and are still able to do within the churches. My memory, my most treasured memory of St. Margaret's is when you open the doors to dignity. The Catholic Church through dignity, the LGBTQIA group organization out of the churches. Imagine, imagine anybody, oh, sorry about that. Um, this is to keep time, not, not to, to hear phone calls. But imagine anybody saying, you're not welcome. You don't belong. You have the courage to open your doors, and they're still open. And you talk to the Catholic Church, whether they realize it or not, so much about welcoming, so much about hospitality, so much about the important work of social justice, which we're all here to do. So gracias, merci, danke, chéchie, abrogada. And Emma, thank you for your work with Metropolitan Community Church. I have many, many friends and colleagues there. The MCC Inclusive Language Guidelines could become the Inclusive Language Bible for all of us, for all of our churches. It's an amazing piece of work that many of my colleagues sweat over. Thank you for being part of that. So my own work, since 1983, well, let me backtrack. Um, I graduated from the Jesuit School of Theology with an MDiv and an STM, women are always more prepared, uh, and came to Washington in 1980 to work at the Center of Concern, uh, a Peace and Justice Center. In, 19, in 1983, just go like this if you can't hear me. In 1983, it became clear to me and many of my colleagues that while churches were opening to women, there still needed to be a place for women to come on board with our own energies. I was quite frankly tired of having to explain to the Jesuits why women should be ordained. <laughs> and so in 1983, uh, my colleague, Dr. Mary Hunt and I co-founded and continue to co-direct WATER, the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual. For 38 years, or I should say 38 years ago, we heard the call, we took the risk, we listened to the needs, we gathered 13 diverse women cross denominations because this was clear to us that this was an issue for all of our churches and interfaith. And we started they challenge us to start water. At first they said, just let it be for women in theology. We all went home and slept and came back and said, wait a minute, the heart of theology is ritual, is prayer, is spirituality, and ethics. And so, huh, water was born. And unfortunately, continues to this day, even through COVID, even through all the struggles. Uh, may it someday, I think, cease to be in existence so that all of this ferment can be part of our very lives. So how do we do inclusive everything at water? We do inclusive everything, inclusive language, inclusive caste, inclusive prayer. That's the challenge. Why? To bring the renewable moral energy of religions into the service of transforming an increasingly unjust and fragile world. That's our challenge. 
The language we use matters. Why? So all are welcome. So all can belong. The language we use in word, worship, symbol, song, and story reflects in God's inclusive and all-embracing love for us as individuals, as a church community, as a society, and as global citizens. The language we use shapes value and meaning. It mirrors our beliefs in radical equality and inclusion, and it helps us create that reality. When we come to pray, we must go forth and put our prayer into actions. This is the theology of inclusion. Simply said, a theology of inclusion is about the divine inviting all people, all kinds of people, to come to the table and to share in the banquet. It means that all are welcome, that all belong. Theology literally means, quote, thinking about the divine. And inclusion means, quote, the action of including or being included within a group. A theology of inclusion invites everyone into the circle. It invites us to pray and act in word and worship with inclusive, expansive, and justice-focused language in scripture, hymns, song, liturgy, sermons, and contemporary language. And how do we do this? Here are some examples that I'll add on to Vienna's and look forward to Emma's. Examples of how to put a theology of inclusion into action so we can become a beloved community. When we use inclusive language, we proclaim out loud that all are welcome, that we all belong. Inclusive language shares power and shifts power from those who have privilege to those who are pushed to the margins. As metropolitan community churches, inclusive language guideline states so well that I'm going to quote it, quote, inclusive language importantly and often uncomfortably also helps to share power, to interrupt the effects of unearned privilege and to repair the spiritual harm done to those who have excessive and unexamined privilege. In these ways, inclusive language benefits all people as we seek together to become a beloved community." Unquote. So here's an example that we prayed this morning in a creed for Pride Month, and I quote, and I understand it was written for today, by the way. Male, female, non-binary, and two-spirited God created us. Lesbian, gay, bi, trans, straight, and queer, God affirms us. Inclusive? Welcoming? Yes, yes. I would suggest that the next round of inclusivity, we speak female or non-binary first. There's always another round, you know. And so we're always, we're always in this spiral. So say female, male, non-binary. Why shift the power that women, as Vienna gave testimony to, can be right here pushing the boundaries for where we need to go. And of course, our boundary for today, for today is non-binary, so shift it even more and say non-binary, female, female, male. Trans-Episcopal, a group of transgender, non-binary, and allied Episcopalians cautions in embracing non-binary folks, a guide for churches. 
that we be mindful of how we use binary gendered language as a catch-all. They recommend either using gender neutral words like people or human beings instead of binary pairings like women and men. Or adding a gender neutral word, we welcome women, men, and people of all or no genders. It's such a stretch for all of us, but we have to go there. Trans Episcopal also reminds us that the most frequent binary language we hear in churches is brothers and sisters. They suggest avoiding this phrase and adding siblings to it. I suggest sisters, brothers, siblings. <laughs> or just siblings. Similarly to four uh, mothers and four fathers, uh, ancestors is the word used by many cultures. It's one that I'm leaning into uh, very frequently. Uh, instead of using the four mothers, which I used in my early litur uh, liturgies. And the same goes for mother, father, parent. This morning, we prayed our father, mother, creator in the Lord's Prayer. Ah, how to make the Lord's Prayer inclusive. <laughs> if my hair wasn't already gray, I'm sure it would become grayer. This, I think, is a challenge because it is so ingrained in us. But you know, the word Lord is so hierarchical, we don't have lords and ladies in this country. So, and it's feudal, and it's, it's, it's a power system. So anyone who figures out how to get rid of the Lord's Prayer, just the titling of it, uh, I, I wait to really hear how a congregation receives that. Um, of course, the language of beloved and friendship is always welcome language. Everybody feels a part of that language. So gender neutral pronouns, all of these take us into all kinds of inclusive places. It's the current challenge for most of us. Inviting people to identify their pronouns can be welcoming. She, her, he, him, they, them, she, they, he, they. Naming pronouns signals courtesy and acceptance of transgender and non-binary people. Now, many people state pronouns at the bottom of their email, on their Zoom name, uh, beginning with meetings. A simple way is, I'm Diane. I use she, her pronouns. What do you use? What about you? What would it be like if in our parishes, in our congregations, we introduced ourselves in that way? Possibly a little more welcoming. Admittedly, for cisgender people, those whose sense of personal identity and gender corresponds with their birth sex, sharing pronouns is often easier. And if you misgender, Simply apologize. It's easily done, and an apology is often easily accepted. So what about inclusive, exclusive, and gender-focused language for the divine? Here comes that next piece of the spiral. Traditional language used for God, even treasured names, can do harm to some people and can place barriers between them and full participation in church life. Inclusive language eliminates exclusive language for God and uses attributes like we did this morning in the prayer of our community. Loving God, merciful God, creating God, sustaining God, healing God, we pray. Another inclusive version is to use divine for the word God. This is the challenge. Why? Because God, for most of us, in our early beginnings, was male. And to get the male part out of God is probably a lifetime challenge. So if we can help one another expand our sense of God beyond male, female, parent, creator, into loving, caring, friend, beloved, 
we will be doing our communities, ourselves and our communities, a great service. And how about divine spirit she that we prayed today? You know, Ruah, Chukmah are the feminine names for spirit. And so praying wisdom spirit, Holy Spirit she is theologically correct and becoming more and more common. Here's an example of the opening prayer for my blessing same-sex couples, which is upcoming in Waterreel. It's actually coming back from the press this week. Sorry, it's not here yet. Waterreels are a quarterly newsletter. There are free copies of this uh, on the table in the back for everybody. Please take one. Um, this is the blessing prayer. Source of being, eternal word, Spirit of Wisdom, Adonai, Gaia, Buddha, Yahweh, Vishnu, Allah, Wisdom Sophia, Cosmic Consciousness, Great Spirit, thank you for this day. Let me take that prayer apart for a minute. The first line is Trinitarian, Father, Son, Spirit. Listen to it again. Source of all being, Creator. Eternal Word, Jesus. Spirit of Wisdom, Holy Spirit. Adonai, which is Hebrew, Gaia, Earth Goddess, Buddha, Buddhist, Yahweh, Jewish, Vishnu, Hindu, Allah, Arabic, Wisdom Sophia, Feminist Wisdom, Cosmic Consciousness, Eco Justice, Great Spirit, Indigenous. You see the power that comes if we open our God language and invite the divinity to be a part of our lives as the divinity is. The divinity must be smiling at us sometimes if we do that. The divinity must be smiling at us when someone waves <laughs> a little louder. So look at the, more carefully at uh, how you pray the divine. Oh, and by the way, here's the backstory to the blessing, in case you didn't know that. The Vatican's recent ban on same-sex blessings has caused a myriad of responses worldwide in favor of such blessings. We, the water community, and many of our social justice-seeking colleagues rejoice in the love of all couples and the abundant blessings which the divine creator showers on our world through them. I think probably everyone here is a part of that as well. But unfortunately, the Catholic Church hasn't caught on again. So, how about race? Let's keep going. There's some tougher ones around there. It's a major challenge of our time. We're called to work diligently to overcome racism. Being right here in Washington, D.C. could not be uh, a louder foghorn calling to us, pay attention, pay attention, pay even more attention. Eliminating racist language, imagery, and symbols in scripture, hymns, song, liturgy, sermons, and contemporary language is a challenge we must accept. Again, my friends, the MCC guidelines remind us, and I'll quote, White is commonly equated with goodness, purity, and being clean, whereas black is often connected to sin, evil, deceit, and death. Each time we use white and black in this way, we reinforce the assumption that black is bad and white is good. And these assumptions have been and are translated in our culture and applied to bodies and skin color, unquote. Preferred words are clean, bright, harsh, bad as sin, not white, dark, black as sin. Shadow, struggle, evil, wrongness, hard, gloom, bright, not darkness, dark, white. You know, light and dark language are a really, they're, they're so challenging for us in Christian churches, especially during Lent and Advent. So be careful or challenge 
whoever is standing up here if they're not as careful as we need them to be. And what about ability? Vienna told the story of Johnny, which is so touching and should be a part of all of our congregations. Thank you, St. Martin's, for being so inclusive. What about our words? Vision, hearing, walking. Those are all words that we should eliminate or speak carefully because they speak of, they speak to being able-bodied. So in a forthcoming prayer, I'm sending forth prayer, I prayed or I wrote to pray, let us go forth to church leaders who are unable to perceive the needs of their people. I used to say, who are unable to see the needs of their people. Shift in language, unable to perceive. Uh, that's language from stirring waters. Uh, to government officials who ignore the cries of the poor, I used to say, who don't hear the cries of the poor. Actually, they do hear and they just ignore it. So ignore it is even more powerful. So the discussion of language, images, and symbols is a discussion about concepts of church. It's a discussion about being circular rather than pyramid, rather than being hierarchical. That's why it's so important. The way we talk ourselves to ourselves and about ourselves and each other is crucial to the way we deal with survival issues like immigration, poverty, COVID, sexual violence, job discrimination, terrorism, stifling the spirit's gifts to women and all marginalized people. Language expresses our worldview. Um, let's see, time-wise here, let me say a little bit about inclusion in worship. Do I have time to do that? Um, uh, you, you, we'll be less time for questions. So. I'll, I'll make it really quick. When you read scripture stories in the lectionary, it's important to make sure they're inclusive and change them to be inclusive if they're not. The inclusive Bible, the first egalitarian translation by priest for equality, is inclusive language version lectionary. Hold it up, please. I was going to bring mine, but it was heavy. Yeah. All right, good. The inclusive Psalms, I recommend non narrow Psalms for praying. Um, the song that we use today, Psalm 92, uh, instead of Oh God, which is what we pray today. Nan's version says, oh, beloved, isn't that wonderful? And heart of my heart, isn't that lovely? And instead of house of God, it uses dwelling place of love. Powerful shift in image. And lastly, the lectionary. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> the, the inclusive lectionary I recommend is the comprehensive Catholic lectionary, and it's online. And you can download it. And it's written by my friend, uh, friends Jane Faya and Nancy Corrin, who are Roman Catholic women priests, who uh, are at the congregation of Mary Magdalene, the Apostle Catholic community in San Diego. And they were up against the lectionary not being inclusive of women's stories and those on the margins. And so Jane, who's bishop, you know, they've all been excommunicated again after 20 years now. Uh, Jane did her uh, theology studies in scripture at the TTU, and so this is, really comes out of her background and her work there. I can go on and on with the stories there, but I won't since, since we have time. Because imagine all the stories of women and marginalized people that are not in the lectionary. How do we put them in there? Finally, Eucharistic prayer. This morning we prayed, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God is right to give our thanks and praise. That's traditional. However, let me give you another version of that, which is one that um, we wrote for the uh, 45th anniversary of the Women's Ordination Conference uh, in, in 2021, it just happened. So here's an example. Sophia, the wisdom of God dwells in you and also in you. Let us open our hearts and minds. We open them to the prophetic spirit. 
Let us give thanks to the giver of all good gifts. It is right to give thanks to Christ. It's a little bit of a shift that's a little more inclusive. And finally, the word of this um, Eucharistic prayer, I just want to draw attention, and this is my closing, to what I learned writing this Eucharistic prayer. One of the trans um, people, women priests, said, let's put Macrina and Matrona and the Ethiopian eunuch into the Eucharistic prayer. I said, who? Here's my spiral. <laughs> so I went to Google and I, and I, and sure enough, here it is. Blessed are you, God of Tecla, Phoebe, Junia, Prisca. They're the early women uh, house church leaders. Blessed are you, God of Macrina. Who is Macrina? She was the elder sister and teacher of Basil the Great and Gregory and Pisa, both fathers of the church. And what did Macrina get? <laughs> Matrona, Saint Matrona, the Bilis of, of Perige is one of the number of female queer saints in the early church who dressed as men to be admitted to all male monasteries. And the Ethiopian eunuch heard the word of God from Philip, was baptized and spread the word. Let me just close there. We have so much to do in terms of inclusive language and inclusive Past, that this is, in fact, what our call to act with justice is about as Christian communities. Stirring Waters, my book that came out during COVID, won two awards I found out yesterday, one for liturgy and one for inclusivity from the Catholic Media Association. I share it with you this morning. We are making inroads. It's amazing. It's amazing. This book is full of inclusive liturgies. Uh, enjoy it. Thank you so much. Diane, thank you so much for pushing the boundaries of our thought, pushing our boundaries of um, how we pray. Um, you've been thinking about a lot and you've given us more to think about. If you look at our Friday uh, email that went out, there was a list of um, resources and uh, nearly everything except for the liturgy that Diane mentioned was on that with resources. So if you want to go and look up uh, the Friday email that went out, you can find those resources there. Um, uh, so thank you for, for mentioning that as well. Our next speaker, Emma uh, spelt pronounced Chapman, is senior pastor at the Metropolitan Community Church of Northern Virginia and executive director of the Transgender Education Association of Greater Washington. Emma studies the use of theology and language and has been doing that in, in worship for decades. Uh, I had some great phone conversations with Emma. Uh, one of the first things she said to me when uh, we got on Access phone, it was Zoom, she said to me, the Bible has a gender problem. <laughs> that was the first sentence. Uh, but she finished off by saying, ultimately, as a pastor and preacher, I never want to be an obstacle to have someone see divinity. Language allows us to open the door to allow all people to have their own understanding of the divinity, of the divine. I want the queer person entering our church to know that they are welcome and that this is home. Welcome to Emma and to our podium this morning. Okay, good, good. I want to thank um, Diana and I also want to thank the two. Uh, you want me to speak louder? Because I can do it. <laughs> I want to thank the two women who came before me today. Uh, before me, metaphorically and spiritually. I want to thank you for pushing at the margins and continuing to do so. 
Uh, so thank you so much. It's an honor to, uh, to be here with you today. I have a lot to say, so I'm going to speak fast. Metropolitan Community Church, or UFMCC, is a denomination formed in 1968, a year before Stonewall, by a Pentecostal minister defrocked for being gay. It is the first denomination formed by the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, and questioning communities. I often say that we never had to vote to be affirming. MCC was born that way. We were made that way. Um, I identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, and questioning. I belong to all or none. Because at any one given time in my life, I have authentically identified and lived as each one. And sometimes it's not always where we are, but it's how we get here that matters. The journey, and like a suitcase covered with stickers of where I've been, I am who I am. And I am my own rainbow. Um, my father was a Methodist minister, and I gave my first sermon when I was 14 or 15, and then I found out what the Methodist church thought about people like me. So I didn't enter the ministry right away, but I still carry my dad's Bible with me. He bought it the year I was born in 1959. It is the King James Version, where Jesus speaks in red ink. And uh, I, I don't use it, but it gives me a great sense of comfort and uh, a connection with my ancestors, so I carry it with me. I did become a part of the UFMCC denomination in 1997, and I was ordained in the denomination in 2004. Um, many, in, in many ways, scales were lifted from my eyes due to inclusive language. So many beautiful names for God, and the encouragement to explore even more holy one, mystery, loving spirit, Go ahead and open up your spirit and your mind and your heart and invite to get in the end. Our, our Abrahamic sibling, the Muslims, have a hundred names for God. And, and we have fallen very short in that. And so I encourage people to explore that. The Lord's Prayer became the prayer Christ taught us to pray. The Trinity became the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Um, and so inclusive language meant a lot to me, and it opened up my eyes beyond the Bible, the weaponized version. All too many people in my communities have been Bible wealthers, have been whipped by the word, and it's a long way back to that Bible for many people. And so I began to bathe and swim in the scriptures and see them anew as a love story between a people and their God. To me, it was clear that if God favored anyone, it was the underdog, the marginalized, the forgotten. And yes, there are indeed gender transgressors in the Bible. There are many of them. Jacob and Esau, could we have any two more differently gendered siblings? Esau, big, hairy, a hunter, living outdoors, favored by his father, one who in our time might have had a deer or two lashed across the hood of his four-wheel <laughs> drive truck and years <laughs> His sentences were short and sweet. His knees are simple. Feed me. <laughs> Jacob, the heel grabber, stayed indoors and lived among the tents. He lived among the women. He was favored by his mother. Later, we we're told he was smooth skin. One who, in our time, might politely be called a mama's boy, or less politely, something else. And he was a good cook. And now, how many men in the Bible are we told actually cook? I think there are about three instances outside of this one. Know that in that time, people struggled with the social and the cultural norms placed upon them, just as we do now. And we can let them bind us and hold us down, or we can rise above them and find our true, authentic, and real self. And in doing so, find our real church and our purpose in the process. Jacob and Esau, regarding that the two struggle together in one body, butting heads so much so that the mother who carried them wondered, why go on living? Why go on living? Now that moved me because this gender struggle is a real struggle for so many of us. We who must wrestle with the warring nature with 
within ourselves as we try to find the means of existence in our society that is both acceptable and authentic. Jacob emerges as the hero of this story. He would later go on to have a dream about a ladder, wrestle with an angel, wrestle with God. His name changed to Israel, which means struggle with God and become a pivotal figure and of huge importance within the Bible. All for one who without a doubt clearly transgressed the gender roles for the time in which he lived. There is no perfect light in the Bible, just illumination and shadows, and we're still finding things queer things, because now queer people are looking for them. Strange people looking for and finding other strange people in the Bible. Good theology, good religion can transform us, not conform us. What of Deborah, prophetess, judge, leader, military strategist, practically a general of the army, bringing the Israelites a great victory through a complicated means, giving credit sharing power for the win to a woman, another woman, not herself. Deborah could have claimed it for herself, but she did not. She gave the credit to Jael, a woman of nomadic tribe. With Deborah's story ending in scripture saying that after the battle, there was peace in the land for 40 years. That's pretty good work. <laughs> How did Deborah even happen? <laughs> In a culture that viewed women so lowly, she rose above conventions that worked to hold women back. Good theology and good religion should transform us, not conform us. And when we make the text and the worship path more accessible, new people find new things. New people find new things that are often hiding in plain sight. And religion evolves. Oh, that's a scary thought for some people. But it does. Religion involves. It even involves in the Bible, for goodness sake. It does so because we come to have a clear understanding of divinity. Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy no unit shall enter the assembly of God. No unit. That's pretty clear. Then in Isaiah, Yahweh says, let no foreigner or outsider who is drawn to Yahweh say, I will surely be excluded from God's people. And let no eunuch say, I am a dried up tree. Isaiah 56, verse 3. Isaiah goes on to say, Yahweh says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial, a name that's better than sons and daughters. What else is there but something in between or outside of the binary? Better than sons and daughters. Good theology, good religion should transform us, not conform us. And language can facilitate that journey or it can impede it. Inclusive language is so much a part of me that anything else can cause a reflexive disconnect within me. And you don't want to have that happen in worship. When people say, well, somebody has to man the booth. No, it's staffing the booth. When somebody says mailman, not postal carrier, fireman, no, it's firefighter. We hold this truth to be self-evident. All men are created equal. Well, well, of course we mean women too when we say men. What? For real? Women were not included when that line was written. I promise you, for goodness sake, when did women even get the right, right to vote in this country? August 18, 1920. Only about 100 years ago. If you mean women, then say women, or better yet, just use a neutral term like all people. In fact, let me do it for you. All people are created equal. Inclusive language in worship. This is important and it's essential because the Bible does have a gender problem. And I believe the Bible's gender problem originates in the beginning in the context in which the Bible was written. And that the approach used then was true, valid, and appropriate for the time and the place in which it was written. Which is, 
thousands of years ago, halfway across the world in a completely different culture for a completely different people using completely different languages. It is important to understand that patriarchy is baked into our religion. It's not in the original recipe, but it is there through the hands and the taste of the cooks who prepared it, because that was the way of the world at that time. I was preaching somewhere and I said, regardless of how you may believe the words of the Bible were inspired, I promise you that the Bible was physically written by one of these. I held up my hand. A man stood up in the back of the church and yelled, no. Okay, I like congregational participation and engagement. Uh, so I just paused. He held up his hand and continued and said, no. It was written by one of these. It took a moment to sink in. He was right. It was written by a man's name. Insofar as we know, what we call the Bible was written some 2,000 to 3,500 years ago by men. Translated by men. Mediated by men. And up until relatively recently, historically speaking, distributed exclusively by men who were addressed as Father, are women in the church of West and mother? No, they're not. Sister, it's kind of an aspiration. So in many respects, women have only relatively recently become a part of the biblical conversation in worship. So regardless of the inspiration, what we have in the Bible is filtered through a man's experience. And if you were to ask an average parishioner to describe God sooner or later, they would use masculine pronouns because that is largely how God has been presented and preached by those who have presented and preached God. I was addressing a class at Wesley Theological Seminary. I think it was Dr. Yutha's class on sexual ethics. And I was talking about transgender and gender non-binary people. And I opened the floor for questions. One student began with, I know God doesn't make mistakes, Part of the joy of dialogue is the revelation of surprise. <laughs> and so a part of me is immediately thinking, uh-oh, I know how that statement usually ends, and it's usually not good. But instead she asks, so if God doesn't make mistakes, why do you think God made transgender people? And I said, oh, that's easy, to provide a clearer image of divinity. To provide a clearer image of divinity a clearer image of God. Here's the miracle of the Bible. It's right there in the beginning, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God said, let us make humanity in our image. So God created humanity in God's own image. Male and female, God created them. OMG, my God is gender queer. Gender non-binary, totally trans male, female, and the pathway in between the two. And yet my God is not exclusively one or the other, neither male nor female, similar to both or unlike either. For goodness sake, my God is they now. And in fact, God later self-identifies simply as, I am, I am that I am. How powerful is that? Things that things like this even peek out around the edges of the Bible is a miracle. God didn't self-identify as a dude, as a man, as butch. No, I am that I am. And that is so very me. I am that I am. However, keeping God male masculine serves the patriarchy and makes women the other, the feminine other. We have misgendered the deity. And I am speaking to preachers here. How on earth could I have possibly missed that for so long? I never want to be an obstacle to someone's understanding of God, of the divine, and yet exclusively referring to God as he does a disservice to divinity. When a trans person is misgendered, called by the wrong gender, it's like not being seen for who you are authentically. And keeping our view of God as male, solely masculine, 
is not only theologically incorrect, but certainly to continue the patriarchy in our society. Feminist theologian Mary Daly has said, if God is male, then male is God. If God is masculine, then masculine is God. What I want you to remember is that the Bible is skewed male. That anything at all female slips out around the edges is a miracle because it does. And that simple fact gives me great hope and causes me to feel affirmed in my feelings that divinity, the great mystery, the creator is gender queer, either male or female, similar to both, but I want to be. Isaiah 42, 14, Yahweh says, I have kept silent for a long time. I've kept still and restrained myself. And now, like a woman in labor, I will groan. I will both gasp and I will pant. That's beautiful, wonderful imagery of a very pregnant divinity trying to give birth to a new thing, birth to something new through us. Trying so hard in labor, it's work. If your God doesn't stretch you and occasionally make you uncomfortable, well, then think about Isaiah 42, 14. Is your God pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> Seeking to give birth to something new through you? How does the imagery of a pregnant God set with you? Is your God so male that you're insulted by the words in Isaiah? Something to think about. Wisdom is the difference between what we have been taught and what we learn. If we are to take divinity seriously, God does not live in here. God did not begin on paper. God did not begin with our words. God did not begin with our understanding and our explanations of God. Divinity is older than the feelings. Divinity stirs within us. Older than the fire, older than the spark that starts the fire, and yet as new and as fresh as the flame that burns on our altars. In closing, the best that we can do with our liturgy and our words is to facilitate an encounter with the divine, to make God more accessible. The trans and gender expansive communities represent a constellation of genders, like stars spread out for a night sky. An expanse of gender so broad and limitless that it may be unsettling to some, frightening even, especially for those whose very foundation is built upon only he or only she. A choice of one or the other, such a small space that is in which to exist, for some to occupy. Move over, make room for others, and make room for a God, a divinity that is so much larger than you can possibly imagine. Thank you, Thank you, Emma. Yeah, please have a seat. So, um, this is the time that the program was originally scheduled to end. I'll make an executive decision to invite all of you to stretch right now. And then, those who are able, uh, let's talk for at least 15 more minutes. We did get a late start. So, let's go till 2 15, which is actually 13 minutes. Uh, so back down and stretch. I invite all of our panelists to come up here. I wrote down so many questions, but I not get to any of them. And I think it's more important that we get to hear your questions than when you hear Greece's questions. Um, but just to whet the appetite, you know, what about music? What about hymns? Inclusive versus expansive, the power shifts, the Lord's Prayer. I mean, just so many rich comments and, and ideas that have come from our three speakers. I could list them talk all afternoon. But I'll give the mic to Diana to, to find your question. Um, and I teach Sunday school and we, when I teach the Lord's Prayer, I call it Jesus's favorite prayer. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> And here they 
they, they inclusify the divinity and also the individual. So in other words, wherever possible, they use neutral, neutral words. This isn't exactly related to gender inclusivity or directly racism, but I'm also interested in the anti-Jewish issues in the scripture and in particularly around that time period of Easter and Lent. But, you know, um, how do we address that? Because the word Jew, for example, Jewish, and all this, that's, in my opinion, this translation of, and use of the English. Um, I, I can say that in, in my church, and when I use it, I usually refer to uh, temple authorities. I usually refer to the authorities themselves when I consecrate communion. I'm very clear that Jesus was arrested and taken into custody by the authorities. The anti-Semitism Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, anti-Semitism, anti-anything is something we need to continually pay attention to. Uh, Jesus was a Jew. You know, so there is great Christians and Jews share a community that I think we need to bring together. Um, one of my books that I brought uh, is a Seder for, uh, I, I think it's a peace Seder. I have several different ones that I've created with Jewish women. At the time of Easter, at the time of Passover, sometimes they, they come together. And um, I, I've learned so much and have been able to share so much in terms of the Jewish Christian connection. And I think that's another spiral that uh, it would be good for our churches to go to. Uh, Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday, Passover, have such a good connection. Richard, you have some questions? Sure, I'll ask one. I'll be the man that asked this question. Um, I have a vivid memory early in my ministry at St. Margaret's um, of a fairly new new uh, parishioner, um, a young man probably in his 20s came, and it was the first time that he encountered a service like ours. Um, and it was actually in the context of a um, like a learning thing, not a service. It was worship with us, but then came to a class. Um, and, and at one point, he was just so sad. He came to me and asked, Richard, I've been praying to God the Father my entire life. Is there a place for me at St. Margaret's? Um, and I told him, yes. But that gut feeling that I had of feeling so unprepared to answer that question and hearing all of y'all's testimony um, about the experience that I cannot ever relate to as a man um, and wondering about the difference between uh, the terminology that you all have encountered in your ministries um, is there a difference between inclusive language and expansive language is there space as long as it's not exclusively uh, patriarchal and masculine in the ways we describe the divine um, is there space for the word the masculine words that so many are attached to pastoral. Because I feel that in that pastoral moment, I wanted to minister the to the young man and make him clear that all are welcome at St. Margaret's. But it's that tension between comforting, being pastoral, but also discomfort and that intentional um, opportunity to grow and to be shaped and not to conform, but to be transformed, as, as Emma said. So I'll, I'll just throw that out there and wonder how. How, how could I better answer that young man's question? The thing that comes to my mind is that we are in a time of change. It's not either or. And we're going to hurt people and we're going to bless people. Whatever, whatever we say. Um, that it is the clear line. Here you're on the right side. Here you're on the wrong side. Here it's, it's the old place. Here it's the new place. We're in that fuzzy world of, of 
make a change. And I think we need to be adaptable to that and sensitive to that. Uh, is this the right of all? We haven't fully shifted from totally father to a new way of being inclusive. And it's going to take work on all our parts. And when uh, those I have consulted her, uh, appalled many people <laughs> by brashness, the only thing I can do is say I'm sorry if what the way I've approached it is working. Uh, and let's try again. Give it another try and see if we can find a way that together we can name God. That doesn't be by the one of us have. Because there's a huge history. Um, my brother is felt the activist with me. We don't even think like anything. Um, he would be appalled at my language. It, it, he, it is father, it is all male. And on the other extreme, it's not easy to do that. Sometimes it's just don't because that is the easier road. But if we really want to work at it, I think we have to struggle. And we have to be open to saying, I'm sorry, I hurt you. I did not intend offense by trying to include someone else who feels left out. I'm sorry I made you feel left out. Uh, when I was ordained, the man who was 96 in St. Albans had been a member of the parish for 96 years, the longest living parishioner. And he refused to come to church to leave because I, a woman, was being ordained. I had to go visit him for three attempts to get him to see him. And when we did see each other, all I could do was cry and say to him, I'm sorry you are hurting so badly and that you feel like you're being pushed out of the church. Trust me, I understand what that feels like because that's the way I felt it my life. And we sat there and cried together. And it's the tears that brought us together. He never left, and he even never crossed the aisle to take the men he came to. Um, it isn't anything I said, it's anything I did. I think it's because we shared our pain openly and honestly. And he sat like this the entire time. <laughs> it was not easy. And it won't be easy for any of us for a while because we're in transition. I think compassion, as you just uh, brought out in me as you were talking again, is, is at the center of how we can sit with one another and accept one another. Um, and while the father's story uh, takes me to Mary Daly's, if God is father, father is, if the father is God, God is father, you know, she says it. Anyway, at the heart of father, we probably all grew up with the Father God. Um, so however we relate to our fathers is how we had an image of God. Some people's relationship with their father was not kind, was, was abusive. And the, the heart of that abuse around uh, fathers, around mothers as well, is what is challenging with using that word to image God. But in a circle, or for the person who's asking you the question, of course there's space for him using the Father God, uh, as there's space for all of us. But when we use whatever words we use, whoever we're talking to, it can evoke something that may be difficult. That's the power of words, and that's the caution of what we use. I know that uh, I, I work with um, several gay men who have like a firm notion of father, and that's good, and that's there. I always encourage them to try and expand that a little bit, but at the same time, I respect that. And if I'm with them, especially individually, if, you know, I often sometimes ask, what, what word for divinity gives you most comfort? And again, I'm fine with kind of using that. And I also explain to them, your, your relationship with God is your relationship with God, however, have that. Um, and, and it's just like uh, it's just like Eugene over here. You can call Eugene Bubba, but not everybody can call Eugene Bubba. It is your personal relationship that enables that terminology. But I always encourage people think about it a little differently. 
Ron last question. Uh, this has been very helpful to me, I think to all of us. The one thing that strikes me is, um, you know, I always think of St. Benedict telling me to listen to the ears of my heart. And so, on the one hand, there's a choice of words and understanding how others hear those choices. But I also think, and I was thinking in particular in the context of what you, Diane, were talking about in terms of racism and the color connotations of different terminology. I'm someone who, who deeply believes in the presence of God in the darkness. So there's, there's also a part of this is about transforming understanding of the words that are there into a new sort of appreciation of that divine relationship. <laughs> One of the liturgies that I do at Advent is called the Womb of Night. And it is just exactly what you're talking about, that there is a power in darkness. The problem is racism has so put blinders on us that we can't even see some of the, we're being kept from the power. And so there's a, a reclaiming of the darkness uh, that we really need to do and we need to do. So please join me in thanking all. So if you're interested in uh, Diane's book, there's copies um, somewhere. So grab her. Directly down the aisle in the other room, I think. They're not only stirring waters. I brought a couple of other copies of books, New Feminist Christianity and some other statements. So to be continued, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Is that in my Okay. <laughs>